I used to teach in a way of saying, yeah, just be better, just play louder, just play stronger, just fit in, just match them. And then I realized that that was the wrong approach because everybody's not the same. It just so happened that I was that way, but we should not expect every woman to be that way. Hello and welcome to Art Restart, where we explore how artists are reinventing their fields and building a new landscape for the arts. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, the producer and editor of this podcast, a production of the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts. In this episode, we'll be hearing from drummer, composer, producer, and educator Terry Lynn Carrington. Terry Lynn has been a jazz legend for many decades now, but allow me to put that into perspective lest you think she's older than she is. So here's an amazing fact. She got her musician's union card at the age of 10. That's right. At the age I was gathering tadpoles in the creek out back, Terry Lynn was drumming professionally with jazz giants around the country. Unlike so many child prodigies, however, her career remained on the ascendant throughout her adult years, to wit, she now has four Grammy Awards, and she is an NEA jazz master and a Doris Duke artist. She's performed on over 100 recordings and has toured and recorded with jazz legends, including Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Stan Getz, and Esperanza Spaulding. In recent years, she's turned her attention to correcting gender inequities in her field. In 2018, she founded the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice at her alma mater, Berkeley School of Music in Boston, and she remains the Institute's artistic director ensuring that new generations of female, trans, and non-binary musicians are welcomed to contribute their talents to jazz. Terry Lynn is also passionate about recognizing the contributions women have already made to jazz. To which she edited a new collection of music titled New Standards 101 Lead Sheets by Women Composers. And alongside that project, she recorded an album titled New Standards Volume 1, that features several compositions in the book, including this piece, titled Windflower by Sarah Cassie. The album, New Standards Volume 1, won the Grammy for Best Instrumental Jazz Album this past February. Not surprisingly, she plans eventually to record all 101 compositions. Terry Lynn spoke to me from her home in Woburn, Massachusetts. I started off by asking her why in 2018, after all the recognition and plaudits she'd already earned, she decided to create the Institute for Jazz and Gender Studies. Well, I had spoke to some young women at Berkeley that were telling me their stories, and I felt like I hadn't done enough to support people coming behind me, women especially, coming behind me playing this music. And I felt like now or never, basically. <laughs> you know, I felt that I had been so concerned with furthering my career and all the work that it takes for anybody to be successful playing jazz, but especially for women to be successful, um, there's definitely extra labor involved. So as you're doing that for yourself, it's easy to not necessarily think about other people. And I realized I was at a place in my career where I could absolutely think about others and work more toward equity in the field. I don't want to assume I know what you mean by saying, by when you say the extra labor that a woman musician has to do. Could you say more about that? What is that extra labor? Well, with any minority group in marginalized communities, there's extra labor. You know, the, the saying goes, you have to be twice as good to get half as much. That's, a, that's an expression in the Black community. And most people think the numbers are more than that. The percentages are more than that. But it goes, you know, the same thing differently, but the same in other marginalized communities. Just for instance, when I had a trio 
with Esperanza Spalding and Jerry Allen, they both talked about how they felt different and felt more at ease playing in this configuration because there wasn't as much chatter going on in their heads. There wasn't the thoughts about, oh, this person, is he hitting on me? Or, you know, does he really like the way I play? Did I get hired because of a look? Do they, you know, think I'm as good as the next guy? Or, you know, those all those questions and all those things that men don't have to deal with. And that's generally what happens in any uh, minority group. You have, you know, extra things to think about, extra burdens. And then, you know, expectations just as a woman in society, there's extra burdens there. You know, you're expected to raise children and to clean the house and all these other things on top of that. You can't just go off and be a genius with a lot of support and just be off in a corner doing that. There's so many other things that you're accountable for. Now, you yourself have talked about how you had a leg up in a sense in that your father was a musician who who was very widely respected, but you also had a remarkable character. You've got to, before I ask you the next question, you've got to tell your Buddy Rich story because it's too good not to hear it. <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, my dad knew so many people. I would say he knows everybody in jazz at that time period. And it was really true. There were far more people that he knew than he didn't know in the business. And those kinds of relationships were very helpful to my career. And I realized that most people, whether male or female, did not have uh, that kind of access. I say he, he gave me both uh, literal and figurative access to the jazz stage. So that was a great advantage uh, for me. But I also, of course, had to have enough talent to deliver something. <laughs> if you have opportunity, you know, you have to have something to back it up. So my first professional gig uh, was when I was 10 years old. And Clark Terry brought me as a guest to Wichita, Kansas, to the festival there. And he had what he called his East Coast, West Coast Jazz Giants with... Jimmy Ross, George DeVivier, Al Cohen, Garnett Brown, Eddie Lockjaw Davis, Louis Belson, and Clark, and Diane Reeves and I were his guests. Buddy Rich was also playing on that festival, and I wanted to meet him. And people said, well, he's in a bad mood. Stay away from him. But he was kind of in walking distance, and I could see him. So <laughs> I went over to him anyway, and somebody introduced me. And they said, yeah, she's here as a guest playing drums with Clark Terry. And he said, oh, yeah, well, you better not be any good. And I said, well, who's going to stop me? And then he looked at me and said, hey, kids, you want to come play with my band? <laughs> so I think it's fair to say you had, since a young age, a strength of character that many people may not have developed by then. So I'm curious, especially as you were listening to these stories from female musicians that made you want to create the Institute, what do you tell a musician who is perhaps almost as talented as you or as talented as you, but just does not know how to take up the space that you've learned to take up? What mm -hmm. Do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, absolutely. And the, the issue really is I shouldn't have to tell them anything hmm. because that's not that's one of the extra burdens that they should not have to carry. What kind of woman to be? Because with women, there's a balancing act. You know, you have to fit in. You kind of have to be one of the boys, but not exactly. You know, and I think that there's a lot of figuring out and work that goes into that. I know people that have changed their identities because it wasn't fun to be a woman, you you know, trying to play jazz in high school. You didn't fit in. You didn't get any solos. You didn't get support. So, you know, people have changed their identities to, to be, trans, you know, transgender male. It's really interesting that it's been such a boys club for so long because people aren't thinking about how has that affected the music, you know, because you're, you're getting this perspective and that's, it's kind of one-sided. You know, what would a different perspective be? A different set of experiences really be if it were ingrained in the music? 
what would it have sounded like if it had been ingrained from the beginning? So I used to teach in a way of saying, yeah, just be better, just play louder, just play stronger, just fit in, just match them. And then I realized that that was the wrong approach because everybody's not the same. It just so happened that I was that way, but we should not expect every woman to be that way or every man because uh, honestly, there are a lot of men that reject that as well. And they're kind of forced into a certain kind of performative masculinity that's not fair to them either. You heard from your the other two women in your trio about what it felt like to be performing in an all-female ensemble. How, how did, did it feel different for you? Not really, because I didn't carry the same burdens that they did. I wasn't thinking about those things, at least consciously. I think I realized later that I was, and I do, but not as overtly and not as consciously, more kind of something that I would push away because it didn't serve me. So that chatter, you know, I just was able to just shrug it off and move to something that was, you know, something that helped me move forward. And I looked at anything like that as something that kept me back. But all I'm saying is that's where equity and fairness comes in because men don't have to deal with that in the same way. There's a question that's at the heart of the Institute and so much of your work and research, which is that you stated, is just what would jazz sound like in a culture without patriarchy? The Institute is five years old now, and you've made a lot of jazz with other women and other musicians in recent years. So do you have a better sense of how you'd answer that question yourself? What would jazz sound like in a culture without patriarchy? Um, yeah, the question is really to you know, be provocative and it's for the imagination because we don't know because it hasn't happened and I would never try to predict the future. I don't know what it will sound like exactly. I do know that we all have to expand in our thinking and expand in our hearing, expand in what we consider good jazz to be. Like, for instance, I had a student who, it was always like, you know, it was a really fine drummer, but I was always thinking, yeah, I wish she would just dig in a little more. I wish she would just be a little more aggressive, or I wish she would do this or that. And those were the qualities and the things that I gravitated to in drumming. Luckily, I didn't really say those things too much to her, but I heard a recording of her recently, and I realized that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the way she plays. That was me coming from the more, as I said before, like, uh, I don't know, like performative masculinity or hyper-masculinity in what I consider good jazz to be. And once I realized there's really nothing wrong with the way she <laughs> plays, that was a pivotal moment for me because I felt that there was some expansion in my listening and in my thinking. Yeah, it makes me think that good mentorship is so similar to good parenting in the sense that the aim is not to create a mini version of yourself, right? Exactly. Exactly. So you've also created several projects that call attention to the overlooked contribution of women in jazz. And in one interview, you said something really interested me that um, you're interested in not just gender alternatives to the jazz canon, but also stylistic alternatives, so that some of the modern approaches to composing can eventually be considered standard too. Mm -hmm. Can you give me examples of what you mean by those modern approaches to composing? Well, in the book, New Standards, 101 Lead Sheets by Women Composers, for instance, we have a graphic score by Jamie Branch. And I've not seen, you know, graphic scores. I can't even picture it. Could you describe that? Oh, a graphic score? Yeah. Uh, it's various. Um, there are various approaches to how to do it. Some are pictures. Uh, some are, are on staff paper and some are not. Some could be on staff paper, but without the traditional notes, you know, arrows and lines and things like that. Jamie's is, in the book, is how do I describe it? It's directions. It's uh, kind of really beautiful the way it's written and drawn, and it creates its own vibe just looking at it. But, you know, then there are directions. 
you know, some notes written or some, you know, directions as far as notes and keys and rhythms, but not on staff paper. And some are, you know, really just beautiful drawings that you're interpreting in different ways, however the directions tell you to. So anyway, that's one thing. And there's a song written by Marilyn Crispo called Rounds, and it doesn't have any lines, any bar lines. So there's another way of approaching it because you're telling the person that there's no meter in the sense of how you normally look at meter. So those are things that you know you just don't generally find. Definitely you didn't find it in the real book. How how big an umbrella can jazz be, do you think? Like is there a point when it stops being jazz or can jazz start incorporating a lot of different genres too? Well, jazz has been incorporating a lot of different genres. That's really the beauty about the jazz of today. It's not just one thing. You know, it's, it's, there's things people like to say, uh, they may say jazz adjacent or jazz inflected or jazz influenced, but people that come from the tradition and know the history and have studied the tradition in a certain way and then choose to put their other influences, their other musical influences in their music, I think it's incre- incredibly fair to still call it jazz. Uh, it doesn't have to have a certain swing rhythm or a certain bebop vocabulary that's obvious. There's still a tradition in how the music was created. And I think that that's the jazz of the future, the jazz of today and the jazz of the future is blending all these things. Now, there's nothing wrong with more pure forms of jazz and you know, traditional jazz. And there are people that have dedicated their lives to doing that. And I completely respect that. But I think we have to make space for you know, where it's going and what's happening today and what people are, you know, what their experiences are. So you have jazz that's mixed with hip hop, jazz that's mixed with R&B, jazz that's mixed with indie rock, jazz that's mixed with classical music. And of course, you know, you have Latin jazz and all the other cultural influences that people bring to their forms of jazz. Are you facing any resistance in the work that you're doing from the jazz establishment, if there is such a thing? (laughs) The jazz mafia. (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure there's resistance more than I know because people aren't coming up to me outwardly resisting. I'm sure there's more than that I'm actually seeing. And people that are resistant to change, that's kind of normal. But I think most jazz musicians I know would like to think of themselves as being progressive. So when you're faced with progressive thinking, you have a choice to try to embrace it or to resist. And I think there's maybe, maybe I'm just being optimistic or naive but I think there's more embracing than there is resistance, at least outwardly. I want to talk about your curatorial practice, starting with, I think, the most recent at the Car Center, where you're the artistic director. You last fall, you premiered part one of a planned four-part multi- multimedia installation. And I think the whole title of it is Shifting the Narrative Jazz and Gender Justice. And the first ty- first part was titled New Standards which is also the name of your latest album, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about how, if you can describe how the idea came up and how you wanted the installation to work in concert with your album. Well, you know, I I keep talking about expansion and I realized that you can bring people to subject matters in different ways. I mean, you can do an interview or a podcast and talk about it. You can make an album and, you know, give some examples. Um, You can make a book and say, you know, here's a way to try this yourself. You know, I'm constantly looking for these various ways to bring people to this topic, to this subject matter. So the idea of just a multidisciplinary approach made sense. And this exhibit is looking at this topic through the visual arts and through film, uh, as well as the music itself. So, uh, yeah, we did it at the Car Center in October, and 
It actually just closed last night in Boston. So it's the second outing um, of this. And yeah, we just had a, a three, three and a half week run at Emerson College Media Art Gallery. Yeah, it's interesting because every space is different. So it's going to be different wherever it is, which is another way of being creative, you know, figuring out what works in different spaces. But one of the ideas also for this installation was to show a multi-directional, multi-dimensional artist. So Carmen Lundy, the vocalist, she has two amazing sculptures in this installation. And Cecile McLaurin Salvant has three pieces that she did, uh, drawings. She's an amazing visual artist. Jasmia Horn, I asked her to reimagine Ella Fitzgerald as far as her clothing and her style. So she uh, made a dress for Ella. Yeah, I have a couple of pieces in there as well. And then there's, you know, visual artists that looked at the theme and did work around the theme. The foundation of the four sections you're talking about were the foundation are films. So for New Standards, we did a film, Michael Goldman and myself, basically documenting the book, the album, and just the need for setting new standards. I asked the iconic artist Carrie Mae Weems, who's a photographer and thought leader, and asked her to look at the theme and to do a film. And she was commissioned by the Car Center to do that. And then she chose to do it on me. Um, <laughs> I thought she would, you know, you know, I was asking her to cast a wide net of just, you know, the theme in general. But she said, you know, you know, you're doing so much all the time for you know, other people and exposing, supporting others. She said, I would like to do something on you. So she did a film on me called The Road to Carrington. And yeah, she has all this old footage and you know, testimonials and just poetry and things that she wrote. And it's a very personal and very nice, uh, very beautiful tribute. That was part of uh, the section that we were calling the female and non-binary gaze. And uh, there's a section called Invisible Labor, uh, which I collaborated with another visual artist, Micheline Thomas. And I wrote a piece called Seen Unseen, and that speaks to Black women, the journey, and the fact that we can be seen in so many ways, but how our humanity is often unseen. This is an extended composition that has been played now twice by full orchestras, but also there's a scaled down version that's played by 15 people. So we have footage of a performance at SF Jazz where Micheline VJs, you know, has a, a library of video and uh, stills that she projects while the music is playing. So we made a film about that and about the theme of being seen and unseen. And so that's the anchor for Invisible Labor. And then the other section is uh, Mary Lou Williams and Jerry Allen in conversation. And I wrote a script about an imagined conversation uh, with these two iconic women. And uh, Anna Devere Smith is going to work with me on bringing this to film. Right now, it exists as audio. I had two actors act it out. And so in the installation, you can hear it and see footage of Jerry and Mary. The, but we will eventually make that a film too. That's amazing. So have you cultivated these other artistic talents all along or or is this more recent? I mean, I don't exactly know how to answer that because like, yeah, I'm constantly cultivating things. I, I write, so that's the first thing. So if I write songs, I'm looking at language. And one of the other things in this installation is, is part of it is a book a children's book called Three of a Kind uh, that I wrote on the forming of the ACS trio, which is Alan Carrington Spalding Trio. And it's the point of this children's book is to inspire young girls to play instruments and dream big. So because I write songs, it wasn't such a 
you know, so it wasn't so far fetched for me to write a children's book, especially during the pandemic. I seemed to do a lot of writing forwards to other people's books, liner notes for albums, you know, all kinds of things. So for me, understanding Jerry Allen and having an understanding for Mary Lou Williams, it wasn't so difficult for me to write a script about a conversation with them. Now, I always ask kind of a systemic question to my guests. You're already, you're already in your way changing several systems to make it easier for female and non-binary artists to thrive in jazz. But is there kind of a no-brainer way that the world of jazz or the mu- music business could be changed so that women could feel more welcomed? Well, sure. There's that. Well, I mean, <laughs> it's the same no-brainer way that it could happen in society in general. You know, people have to have more empathy and have less desire for power, greed, all of those things we have to address within ourselves. And when we can have a human revolution within ourselves, then that's when society changes. That's when the world changes. That's when jazz will change. So when people ask me, what can I do? Like that question came up a lot during the aftermath of 2020, uh, especially, you know, when it comes to race. And I always would say, you already know what to do. Doing what's right is not that mysterious. It's right there in front of us. We know what to do. It's just, it takes work. It takes more work to open space. You know, it's much easier to just be okay with things as they are, to follow, you know, the trends as they've been set and have everything status quo. But to be inclusive and to be radically inclusive, that's going to take a lot more effort. So don't ask me what to do. First of all, educate yourself because that's what I have to do every day. I'm not a scholar. I didn't study this stuff. But if you see a need or you see something that needs addressing, then you have the opportunity to address it, you know, or not. And, um, It's a journey. It takes time. It takes energy and effort. And it takes education. You know, we don't know everything. But the last thing you want to do is ask people from a marginalized community to also educate you and also do part of your work. If you'd like to learn more about Terry Lynn and read a longer version of this interview, just head to uncsa.edu slash art restart. If you enjoyed this episode, hey, please tell a friend about it. We rely on your word of mouth. And let me know if there's an artist change maker in your neck of the woods you think we should profile. You can find me on Instagram at PC Talenti. Our theme music is by Shanghai Restoration Project. I'm Piercarlo Talenti, and on behalf of the Thomas S. Keenan Institute for the Arts, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>